Good morning, and uh, welcome to worship at Discovery Church. We're grateful uh, for not only people who can gather in the building, but also for people who are able to watch via live stream. Um, I hope that that never, uh, it will lose its luster, but I hope that it never uh, ceases to be amazing in, in some sense, um, that we can gather in that way. And so as, as we enter into worship, we are reminded that we're first called into worship. And so we'll hear this call to worship uh, from Psalm 111. So let's begin by saying together, We will extol the Lord with all our hearts in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him, to him belongs, belongs eternal, eternal praise. praise. Cornerstone.
And now we're going to take a minute to uh, greet one another with the peace of Christ. Also, as we do that, uh, we want to announce with excitement um, that there were two babies born this week, um, which is awesome. So we have now Anna Baker and Anya Barnaby. So, Oh, wow. Ada. Well, there we go. So <laughs> we want to wish them a congratulations. Um, and if any of them are here, we want to especially say hi, but we're also <laughs> grateful that they're on li live stream. So feel free now to take a minute to greet one another in the peace of Christ. <laughs> it's Ada. I know I had trouble with it too. <laughs> well, actually,
thinking about this um, and thinking about this song in particular, Lead Me to the Cross, um, it's certainly true. Uh, we want to pray that God would lead us in that path of life uh, in a cruciform kind of way of living. Um, but I noticed there's one sort of wonky aspect about this song um, that I, I didn't quite feel fully comfortable with, especially after thinking about it a lot. Um, so there's a line in the chorus that says, rid me of myself. Um, and to be honest, I'm not fully convinced that that's a faithful way to think about self-denial in the Christian life. Um, we're not called to be empty shells uh, that God can kind of use as puppets, um, but we're actually called to be active participants in God's work. Um, and so I've changed it, and I hope it works and it's not too awkward, but I've changed it from rid me of myself to humbling myself um, after kind of the pattern of Philippians 2. So I'm hoping that, that can be a way for us to sort of slowly change our minds towards uh, the season of Lent um, as we begin to enter that season. So let's sing now the Lead Me to the Cross. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember redemption still, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom. Everything I want out deep, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Humbling myself, I belong to you. Everything I once held dear, I've 
to bring all of our worries to him um, and whatever we're going through outside of the sanctuary. So I invite you to just take a quiet minute and just talk to God. Psalm 73, 25 through 26 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In line with the words of that psalm, uh, we're going to sing another prayer, uh, Be Thou My Vision.
King of heaven. We are so grateful to be here with you today, and we are so grateful that you are the ruler of all, and that you have won the victory. Thank you for calling us to be your own. God, humbly we come before you, and we Uh, just ask for your mercy and your grace again. We pray that you'll prepare us now with listening ears and listening hearts open to the words that Pastor Paul will speak to us, the words that you have given him, the ideas that you have formed in him. And we ask, too, that you will fill him with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name and that you will empower him to speak all that is true, that you would have him speak to us. Thank you for this time that we have, God, to be here with you in community and uh, that we have this time to experience your awesome presence and your unmatchable love. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to uh, hear the scripture reading from Grayson and Melanie. And uh, also at this time, Eyes to See is uh, dismissed to their, their Zoom and I think in person, but... me by standing either physically or in your heart before God as we hear these words. Be careful to obey all the commands I, I am giving you today, then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the o Lord swore to give to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. 
Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scripture says, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's very word. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. And I add my own good morning to you this morning. Our thanks to Grayson and Melanie for leading us in the scripture passage. For those of you who are present here, we have just a little uh, package for you called a Lenten bag. Uh, they are in the back. We would just be honored if you would pick that up and bring that with you. And for those of you who are uh, watching at home, it is our goal to be able to deliver those Lenten bags to you sometime this week so that you would have it on the first Sunday of Lent. Lent begins sometime this week. Uh, for several years, we have had a uh, Ash Wednesday morning gathering, uh, a variety of ways to begin your uh, Lenten experience. Uh, we don't feel that we can do that safely. So, uh, we are going to bypass that, but you'll be receiving something, everyone in the Discovery family, uh, a short four-minute devotional from me about Ash Wednesday and uh, its role in our place. In fact, this Sunday, uh, today is not a Lenten Sunday, even though we're starting a series on Lenten, and it's simply because that I want to be able to preach three messages in a row about the three temptations and not have two in a row and then a big gap while we're gone on vacation and come back and do the third. I just wanted to do all three of them in the row. And this Sunday, we look at that very first temptation that was read in Matthew chapter 4. I'm sure you're reminded of the prayer that is popular to many of us where there's a line in there that says, lead me not into temptation. I don't know about you, but I can find it very well on my own, thank you very much. <laughs> when we pray that part of the Lord's Prayer, we know that it is God's work to deliver us, not to lure us in. It's not as if he wants to stick us in the room with the devil and see how long we last. That's not his role. God does not lead us there. But in our text, it does say that Father God did lead Jesus to temptation. Oh, he did something different with his own son. And the reason why is so that we would know that we would never have to face temptation on our own, all alone. Yes, we are living in a world where we are tempted with a quick fix, with instant gratification, with building our own empire. We're even willing to do an end run in order to meet our wants rather than to trust and rely on God to meet our needs. Because we often think that if God's no, not going to make me king of the hill or the top of the heap, I'm going to find a way where I can get there myself. That's not the way of God. There is that temptation to bow down to the gods of money and success and power and prestige. And this first temptation that Jesus endured and won victory over gives us a picture of what we face and how we can remain faithful. He shows us how to overcome. Jesus has been there 
when we find ourselves there and we find grace when we do fall. We are reassured by his love and he gives us the power of his spirit to move forward. Let's reflect on this first temptation of Jesus. In this first temptation, we see that it wants Jesus to promote himself. I call it the the lure of self-promotion. Jesus shows us that we don't need to try to impress others with any personal adornment or achievement. We don't even have to try to impress God, and we certainly don't have to try to impress ourselves. Because our true identity is found not in our accomplishments, but in the identity that we are the child of the high king of heaven. And that's grace. And it is not found in the adoration of others, but in what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. The place of the temptation and of our temptation uh, is in the wilderness. Uh, God's plan to build a road of peace with him starts there in the dangerous desert. Jesus is hurled there into the wilderness after his baptism of 40 days of fasting. And the desert is very significant because that's where God prepares people for what he has planned for them. God has great plans for us and he prepares us by giving us times in the desert, times in the wilderness. So if you feel like you're in a place where you have lost your regular routines, where things are not running smoothly as they were before, when you feel a bit shaken or maybe you've lost your grip because of circumstances, God is using that to prepare us, to strengthen us for what lies ahead. So in case you didn't get the subtle hint, that's all of us, right? That's all of us. Just excuse me for a moment here. These temptations of Jesus include quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the Old Testament book about desert life. It's about life in the wilderness. Deuteronomy includes the 40 years of what it was like for Israel being led by Moses to be in the wilderness. And especially when we get to chapters 6 through 8. Chapters 6 through 8 lists the ways in which God provides for Israel to survive and even to thrive. Because it was in the wilderness that he led them by a pillar of of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to cause water to come out of the rock, to turn bitter water to clean water. And when Israel was hungry and when they wanted to return to those good old days of slavery, when they could have onions and leeks for their meals, these these old ways and patterns, as sad and self-destructive as they are, wanting to go back to onions, there's a measure of comfort in old and previous ways that somehow draws our humanness rather than going into a new area where we trust God completely. In the temptations of Jesus, we see that where Israel failed, Jesus succeeds. He always does. Following God's ways are always better. Always. And so we get to the temptation itself. After a mighty blessing by Father God and the Spirit at his baptism comes the mighty test. After 40 days, the temptations come that are recorded. 
At first, we don't think that this is a very good thing for Jesus to get tempted, but in the end, we are certainly glad because of what it means for us. At this very vulnerable place, the tempter comes to know when Jesus is weak. And while the purpose of fasting, which Jesus did for 40 days, the purpose of fasting is to draw us closer to God, to remove our dependence on things and grow our dependence on God even more strongly, it does weaken us. It does cost us. And it makes Jesus weak in his humanness. I remember at one of the Embers to Flames prayer sessions that was, and I'm sure we'll start once again, a uh, monthly West Michigan prayer gathering that Pastor Mary hosted here. At, at one of those sessions, uh, one of the teachers said that while the tempter does not know all things, he's like a good used car salesman. Once around the car, kick the tires, look under the hood, he pretty much has us pegged. He knows where those weak points are. And as C.S. Lewis wrote in the Screw Tape Letters, the devil is an opportunist. He will take any advantage he can. And Jesus is no Clark Kent seemingly mild-mannered on the outside, but underneath he is impervious to these bullets and such. No, this was a very real temptation. Hunger puts us on the edge. It makes us a little bit ornery and low on patience. And for those of you who have gone on diet plans, you know how a few days on lean cuisine can make us that way. And this was his human weakness at the time. And then, the line. Since you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. At Jesus' baptism, he was given a clear assurance that he was loved by Father God. And the tempter asks, 40 days later, Are you really the unique Son of God? Are you really pleasing to Him? Forty days ago you saw it. Forty days ago you heard it. But, I mean, is it really true? Don't you need to prove it? Impress me. If God's Word is true, then show a sign. Do something to show that it's actually true. And while you're at it, why don't you just make something to eat? A real temptation. A real hunger. He had the memory of that baptism, and yet he is tempted to show it, to prove it. To prove that it's true. Do something really cool to show who you really are. This temptation is to yield to the human tendency to promote ourselves, to show off, to answer that question, impress me. And for Jesus, it seems like the evil one is tempting him to do a magic trick, but he's actually tempting him to meet a certain need without relying on God. The temptation is to move forward outside of faith, outside of trust, and to make something to eat. Prove that it's really true. The tempter even seemed to give the indication, I mean, this seems like a reasonable request. You have a special status, son of God, and you're hungry. Why not just do this? And hunger isn't what God wants, is it? Impress me. Show who you really are. That wooing line. As we come under temptation, we need to come understanding the great 
truth of God. That God loves us not because of any of our accomplishments, not because we have impressed him in any ways, but God loves us just because he is a loving God. The temptation is to move into arenas outside of God's plan in order to make ourselves proud or puffed up. Instead of understanding and living in the truth that God loves us as we come to him. Just like that. Because we have a human tendency to mess things up, right? To act out of sheer selfishness. Our thoughts, our motives, our actions outside of grace separate us from God. Which is why God sent his son to fully identify with our human needs. And then he could offer himself on the cross as payment for our sin and our selfishness and our shame. And then to rise three days later so that new life is given to anyone who comes to his son, confesses in him and believes in him. The cross and the empty tomb is the proof of how far God will go to redeem us, to claim us as his own. And as followers of Jesus, this same test that Jesus faced comes to us. The tempter knows our weakness. He knows where we are vulnerable. Whether that is a lifelong trait or whether that is the circumstances that we find ourselves in. He's like that good used car salesman. He can sense it. And oftentimes, as Martin Luther pointed out, he attacks us when we are most alone, doesn't he? When we are most alone. And we feel there is no one there to help us, which is a lie. And we don't even want to acknowledge that we do need outside help or anyone else's help. That we can handle it all on our own. Which is another lie, right? He knows how to get us to not go God's way. To not go the way of faith. To not take shelter and refuge under the wings of God when that is the only place to really feel secure. The tempting way is the easy way out. And I have found that in the journey of life, if there is an easy way and a hard way to accomplish something, God is found most often in the hard way. And there is a difference between doing something in our own strength and doing it in his strength. And the evil one will do whatever he can to move us from faith to doing actions and deeds not done out of thankfulness, but in order to try to prove that we are worthy of God's love, that we really are the beloved daughters and sons of God. Let me prove it. Let me prove it in what I do. The tempter loves to lie and suggests that we are deeply loved by God's conditional love. The truth is, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. But then the taunting comes, right? But look at your life. Look at your problems. Look at the crisis that you're in. And how can a God of love love you like that? Get your act together, man. Prove that you really are God's child. Impress me. Show that it's true. Show that his love is worth it. And this moves us away from faith and trust in God. Moves us away from taking God at his word that he loves us unconditionally to trying to earn favor, to earn approval, 
to show ourselves worthy of God's love. For there is a difference between doing something out of thankfulness and gratitude and doing something out of pride and out of merit. Or we want to do something to prove something to ourselves that we indeed are worthy of God's love and to join the world in seeking the applause of others to, to make me feel like indeed I have I've done what I can do to, to earn God's love. And we'll take shortcuts and we'll do cutthroat cat tactics and we'll tell lies, big and little, and we'll work ourselves to death just so we can make it to the top of the hill in any way we can to try to prove to ourselves, to prove to others, or even to prove to God. And when we do that, we are following the operating procedure of our world and not the way of the kingdom. We want to show that we are somebody. When Jesus has done all to show who we truly are, that we belong to him unconditionally. We are children of his, and we have no need to put on any ears. And when we are hungry and weak and uncertain, he gives us the grace just to stick close to him and to let him provide. The way that Jesus deals with temptation is a way that he teaches us to deal with temptation. Jesus defeated temptation to provide a way for us to gain the victory over it. And he shows us that the word of God is powerful. So powerful that its word alone defeats temptation. And with each temptation that comes Jesus' way when he is weak and vulnerable, comes a response taken directly out of God's word, directly out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the time when... <laughs> Israel failed so often, Jesus always succeeds. He always does. What Jesus does, because he knows God's word, is he is able to rely on the Spirit, to know what scriptures to bring up and to present in his circumstance, in his situation, to defeat the evil one and the work of his. Ephesians tells us that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what we need. We respond to temptation with this truth to show that sin isn't the victor. Temptation, you have no place in my mind. You have no place in my heart. I rebuke you and command you to leave because Jesus is my king and he is my Lord and I follow him. It comes from knowing the word of God and having it have a place in our home, a home in our hearts. And with his word, home in our hearts, when we do fall, he gives us the grace to forgive, to pick us up, to know that he never abandons us, and he sets us forward once again. What was the way of Jesus? Knowing God's word, speaking it, using it. Another way of Jesus that doesn't come across here, I believe it does because he spent the time in the wilderness fasting and drawing close to the God. I believe that this practice, what some of the modern wisdom of the church teaches is that of what I would call contemplative prayer. There's probably better names for it, but I'm just calling it contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is just spending time with God. Not praying so much my needs, not so much praying my urgent requests, but prayer just simply in the presence of God and listening to his voice. 
This type of prayer is a slower prayer than we often pray, one that calms us down, one that allows us to listen. I've learned a lot about contemplative prayer, especially from an author named Richard Foster. And, and one of the ways that he has taught me that I use time and again when I am nervous or worried or, or overly concerned about something or even a little bit concerned about something, he teaches me the breathing prayer that I, I present that to the Lord. I breathe that out as I present that to him and I breathe in his grace and I breathe out my worry, and I breathe in his mercy. And it's a slower type of prayer. And I can pray, pray my requests like that, but I'm consciously breathing it out and breathing in his grace and mercy as Evan was striving to teach us, humbling ourselves before him and to receive his grace in our full being. Contemplative prayer can include meditating, taking a small part of God's word and just, just chewing on it, repeating it over. We've done that a few times in worship and blessing God for it and reflecting on it of repeating it at a slower pace. Foster suggests contemplative prayer is also listening to God, to go to a place where we can slow ourselves down. I believe Jesus was doing this in the wilderness. They had been spending this kind of prayer with Father God. Here is a quote from Foster. Through contemplative prayer, we can keep ourselves being pulled from one urgent issue to another and from becoming strangers to our own heart and God's heart. Contemplative prayer deepens in us the knowledge that we are already free, that we have already found the place to dwell, that we already belong to God, even though everything and everyone around us keeps suggesting the opposite. This upcoming season of Lent, some of the traditions have of giving up something for Lent or taking on something new. Well, if you're looking for taking on something new, I offer this suggestion. Just try praying a bit differently in contemplative prayer this season of Lent not forsaking what we already do, but trying something maybe for some of us brand new, slowing our prayer down, just being in the presence of Father God as Jesus was in the wilderness those 40 days, taking our needs, the needs of others, breathing them out, presenting them, breathing in our grace, his grace, and his mercy. This first temptation is a temptation to try to impress God, to impress others, or to impress ourselves to do something to show that we are worthy of being accepted and being loved. Rather, we need to practice the truth of God's love, that his love is unconditional, to grow in that understanding and practice that through his word and through prayer so that the things we do do are done out of gratitude to God 
and not to try to gain anyone's approval. The truth. God loves us as we are. And there's a flip side to that, right? (laughs) The other side of the coin. God loves us so much, he accepts us as we are. And God loves us so much, he wants us to change. Be more like his son. And to grow in him. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Father God, how we bless you for your great love. We thank you that we know that the high king of heaven reigns and rules. We bless you that you are one who took on the best that the evil one could offer and you showed that you are the victor. And we have come to worship you, to bless you, and to honor you. And Father, we pray that the power of your spirit will indeed strengthen us when we come up against temptation. Temptation to take the shortcut. Temptation for moving in a way that is outside of your grace and love and direction. And at those times we need your forgiveness and we need your grace and we thank you that you bring it and then you set us on the right path. Father God, we pray that you will fill us with your spirit more and more and that you will treat us with your care and tenderness. And Father God, we pray that you will be with the needs that we have as a gathering of people who have faith in Jesus. Help us to live in the humility and the grace that we see in Jesus. And Father, we lift up those who are in need of your care and goodness. We lift up Gail, that you will continue to help her to gain strength and wholeness. We pray for Jane and Gil, and Dale and Dot. Father God, we pray that you will provide for them the needs they have every day. We pray that you will be with Dan DeVries, who suffered a stroke late this week and is in the hospital, that you would bring healing to Dan, that you will surround Dan and Rosemary and their family, and we know of Kara. We pray, Lord, that you will surround them with your grace and that you will give the doctors wisdom. At the same time, we lift up Russ's brother, Mark Jansen, that you would provide healing and that you would provide strength and grace for Mark and Leanne and their family as they battle the cancer within him. Father God, we continue to pray and we bless you for for Mike and Michelle and for the the strength that you've given to him. We pray that you'll continue to bring healing and that your grace will continue to abound. We pray, Father God, for Sue and that you continue to give her strength and as she met with the pulmonary doctor this week that he would bless her with increased strength and health and we join with her in praying for her granddaughter. We know that her family is very dear and precious to her. We pray for Daniela in her high-risk pregnancy, and we ask Father God that you will protect her and watch over her and the baby. We pray for Doug that your presence and grace would be triple-fold upon him. We pray for 
Krisha and her healing from her injury to her MCL. That you would give wholeness and strength to her. Father, we lift up these, these needs of our family and we lift up to you the needs of our extended family too. We lift up our youth that you will protect their hearts and minds and we pray, Lord, that you will protect all those who are involved with their education. Guide and direct them to serve our youth, to help them to see you in this beautiful world of yours and to sense your safety. We bless you for two young lives. And we pray for those who continue to carry young life, for Annalise and Lisa. We pray that you will grant them and their children complete safety and security and health. We pray for our neighbors this week on Coleman, that you will give an extra blessing to them and that they would know that that blessing comes from you. And we lift up our missionary partners. We pray for uh, partners relief in Myanmar. And we have heard of, of what's been going on in the news and we pray for Steve Gomer and for uh, his organization. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless them as they continue to strive to minister to, to deep needs within that country. We pray that you will bless us this week as we serve our neighbors with a mobile food pantry. And we ask, Father God, that you will bless those who come, not just with food, but that you would uh, bless them with a touch of your grace and your love. And for the workers who come, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, bless them for giving of their time and their energy and coming in cold weather to serve neighbors in your love. And we just join together in saying, we do this out of gratitude and not to earn any points with you, but just to uh, express our thankfulness that you meet our needs. We thank you for your grace. Uh, we pray that you will bolster our resolve to live lives of love and kindness so that you are honored. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son who makes all this possible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been called into worship and we've responded in song. Uh, we've heard God speak to us through his word and we've responded in prayer. And now uh, we are sent out into the world, into our various uh, workplaces, uh, whatever form that might look like now. And uh, as we do that, I know it's been almost a year uh, of this pandemic um, and all of the ways that it's upended our lives. Um, and so many of us, I wouldn't be surprised if it was all of us, feel weary um, in some way or another. And what we're doing this, this year for Lent um, in one small practice is we're singing this song, which uh, points us to sort of the hope uh, that we have ultimately in Christ, that the work that we're doing uh, throughout the week in the however uh, significant or insignificant it feels uh, is actually uh, work that we can do uh, to participate with God in his redemptive work in creation. And so this song is a new one. It's going to uh, help us sing about uh, the ways that God is using our work. Um, yes, even the things we do not on Sunday um, to bring about his kingdom. And so uh, we'll be singing this pretty regularly during Lent, um, and so I hope that it serves that purpose well and that you all uh, really appreciate um, singing about work in a way that maybe we're not used to doing in church. So um, let's stand and let's sing together, Your Labor is Not in Vain.
announcements as we've been doing for a little bit now we have uh, just show up we can hear um, a professionally read scripture reading um, and get a chance to fellowship together a little bit pray together a little bit um, but fundamentally to just hear God's word read and it's a wonderful time so there's fellowship time at 645 and then the reading is at 7 and the small group prayer session begins at 730 also, uh, we are having, as Pastor Paul mentioned, our mobile food pantry this week. Um, so if you're able, uh, you can sign up on the uh, email sign up um, that Sarah sends out. And if you can arrive by about 4.30 uh, to help unload and sort the food, that would be really helpful and help us get started right on time at five. Also, uh, Sunday mornings, we have the chance uh, as a, a congregation to uh, not only have some time with Pastor Paul, uh, to kind of talk and uh, chat and pray, uh, but also uh, time to pray with Pastor Mary. Uh, so those are two separate times we have uh, available on Zoom um, before worship. So 
there's info in there and there's also info in weekly emails. So we definitely invite you to do that. Um, we welcome all those kinds of things. Uh, finally, um, we have also uh, the Jubilee Fund. We want to consider giving to that because it helps uh, us as a Discovery family um, uh, serve our neighbors and our own family as well. And so we want to start the year off with a healthy sized fund so that the deacons have a lot of freedom to uh, help others on behalf of this church, Christ Church. Um, and also, uh, as usual, we have uh, the ability to pray together um, and in ways that we can bring our needs to the Lord. So we can send those prayer requests via email, uh, or you can visit the website, or you can write them down, or we also have Pastor Mary and Bruce uh, who are here to pray with you um, whenever you need it. So um, we'd invite you to do that. Uh, and so I'm going to invite also Pastor Paul to come up for the blessing. Into it, but no, no, I think, that's I think fine. we handle it really well. That's fine. Good. 